Okay, uh, okay. welcome yeah, to welcome the Maui Museum. Uh, we're very excited about this. this. is our third program that we've had on the early history of Ramapo College. And uh, we're, we're anticipating perhaps one or two more. Uh, and and uh, those of you who are around in the first 10 years, I have a copy of the video that was made on the 10th anniversary, the roast of uh, George Potter. It was done in October of 1981. Uh, you'll get an email from me in the next couple of weeks as to a place that we can find in the calendar for that. And also Vince Marchese has volunteered to put together a, a photo program that he has of all of his tremendous programs on Ramapo and the building of Ramapo and the early buildings and so forth. So that's another program you can anticipate. Uh, <laughs> So the Maui Museum is a town museum. We're very excited about it, uh, preserving the history of Maui in the local area. Of course, Ramapo College is part of the history of Maui. Right now we have uh, rotating exhibits of, uh, on women's suffrage and Ramapo College. Uh, hopefully next week or 10 days, we'll have a, a short video overview of the uh, uh, exhibit on Ramapo. Uh, check our website, mauermuseum.org, for that video. We have a very exciting exhibit on Palisades Amusement Park. Those of you who grew up in northern New Jersey, the metropolitan area, perhaps remember going there. And uh, the Levo Gallery. Levo was a photographer who lived in Mawa who, who documented many of the important events around town for about 40 years. Our permanent exhibits include the Donna Cooper Model Railroad, uh, Les Paul and Mawa, and we have an old station in the middle of town. Some of you might remember when you were at Ramapo. Coming up on January the 4th, we have a lecture by Anne Gordon, a, a scholar on women's suffrage at 7.30. Uh, January the 23rd, uh, a, a program at 11 o'clock on January 23rd on Starting Your Family Tree by Kathy Hajo, a current faculty member at Ramapo. That should be very informative. February 20th, History of Palisades Amusement Park. That's been one of our most popular lectures. Uh, the, the programs, this will be our third program on Palisades, uh, been very well attended. March 1st, a program on um, quilts, 1800 to 1976 by a friend of the museum, Peggy Norris. Our next program is actually on December the 7th, the son of Les Paul, Jean Paul, will discuss working with his father in the 50s and 60s, uh, traveling and, and playing drums in his father's trio. Uh, that should be a very interesting program. I call that to your attention. We have an extensive archive in the museum. Uh, and we do uh, educational programs, groups coming in to, to tour, the, um, tour our exhibits and uh, listen to presentations. We have a museum store. I don't know if our good friend Mitch Kahn is on or not, but uh, Mitch Alvin Kahn is still in publication. We remember Henry and Mitch uh, from Pioneer <laughs> Settlements to Suburbia. Also a book on, on Palisades. Uh, we need new members. Like all cultural institutions, we're suffering under this pandemic. Uh, our membership has dropped somewhat and we need to bolster that. And please become a member and please think about uh, a donation, any kind of uh, um, modest donation or even better. Uh, we, we very much appreciate it. So again, all of this information is on our website, uh, mauermuseum.org. We're open on Saturdays from one to four. And now without further ado, I'm gonna close this out and we're gonna go back to the main screen. Ken, can you Go back to the main screen. We can pull up our three main panelists. You remember our good friends, Nancy Mackin, uh, Cliff Peterson, and Eddie Safe. 
and they're going to talk about the early years. And here we go. I got it here. Okay. Ken, can you? I, I can't do it from my end because we're sharing your screen. Okay. How do I, un, I, I, why do I unshare? I'm just share screen again. You should say unshare. Down. You should say unshare. That's right. But I'm not, I'm not there. On your computer? Go move your cursor okay, over again. Stop share. Okay, there, there go. we go. Okay. Uh, Sorry about that delay. Here we go. So Nancy has volunteered to go first and she's going to talk about her early years at Gramopo. Thank you, Nancy. Hi, everybody. Uh, I've written a, a few things down. I had to write them down because it things from 50 years ago don't immediately come to my mind as quickly as they used to. But I, I do remember in about 1970 asking my parents, uh, asking my mother and my stepfather, I should say, about what life was like 50 years before that. And uh, I was always amazed that they talk more about well, less about the war, the depression, uh, the, the, the wants of so many people who lived then, and more about the things that actually had improved for them in terms of their own physical lives, about where they lived and how they lived. And, and I, uh, I'm amazed now that here I am, 50 minutes, 50 years later, being asked to talk about the past 50 years. It's mind boggling to think that we've all been in this venture together for 50 years. Um, for anybody who's much younger who's on this call, you'll discover that 50 years goes by a lot quicker than you think it will be when you're young. Um, so I've been thinking about 50 years ago and thinking about what life was like 50 years ago. And I'm reminded of just a few things. Um, I watched, um, the movie The Way We Were, which was a 1973 movie with Barbara Streisand and Robert Redford, happened to be on TV last week. And, and watched that and was thinking about the early 70s and was reminded that when Ramapo was being conceived and indeed opened, uh, things like, well, uh, let's say Richard Nixon was our president. Uh, the Vietnam War was still very much in play and protests were gaining traction all across the United States, particularly on college campuses. Um, the assassination of, of Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Kent State were fresh in our minds. Civil rights and women's rights were becoming more than dreams, but not quickly enough for many of us. New Jersey approved two new public colleges. Ramapo was one of them. Bill Cahill was our governor and the population of New Jersey at that time was 7.1 million. Today it's 8.9 million, more than 20% increase over these 50 years. And we are living ever closer together. And certainly Mawa was one of those places that gained a lot of population, um, at least in part due to the college relocating there and many of us and many faculty and staff and even students living in the town. I'm uh, thinking about what it meant to have a new college in New Jersey. New Jersey hadn't had a new college in a while, a new, certainly not a new state college for decades. And here along come these new upstarts which the legislature approved and the governor approved and the mission was approved. But the fact that we were literally upstarts, we didn't have failing grades, we didn't have departments, we talked about the liberal arts when most of the public colleges in New Jersey were mostly teacher training institutions. And we talked about something called interdisciplinary, which most people didn't really understand. And in the end, despite the fact that they approved all of this, they didn't really give us the money to live out the mission fully as we originally conceived. And that's probably true until this day. I'm sure Bob could 
speak to that at some point about how difficult it's been to get the funds necessary to live out, truly live out that mission that we had from the very beginning. I came to Ramapo in 1971, having worked as a assistant registrar at Jersey City State College where I graduated from for two years. And I'd heard about the new college and opening Mawa. I had no idea where Mawa was, but I knew it was in the opposite direction from my apartment in North Bergen. And I thought that maybe driving in another direction could be fun. That was about it. I didn't have any grandiose notion of what I was about to do. It was simply a new job. Now I had to get an AAA triptych to tell me how to get to the college to give you an idea about how far away Mawa was back then and how little known it was to any of us. Uh, we still had on that campus, I'll never forget that day, I had to stop on Route 202 while they herded the Black Angus cows across the road <laughs> because they used to move them from what we what was Northfield now and the, and the farm. And everybody stopped and everybody waited. And uh, I knew that I was in a very different place from Hudson County where I grew up. I met up with a bunch of people from all across the United States, all across the United States, uh, dozens of us. We were all, all new to the college. We didn't know each other. Very few people knew each other before they arrived at Ramapo. We had to get to know everyone. I remember that George and Margaret Potter had dinners before we all came to campus. And we all sat in the Van Horn house on Route 202 and uh, were introduced to a bunch of people who, of course, whose names we didn't, couldn't remember five minutes later, but we certainly got from them an idea of what their expectation was for the campus. And they got us very excited about this new, new venture that we were entering into. Now, I always thought that George must have hired us all because he thought we knew what we were doing, but the idea of opening a new college, we didn't know anything about that. We simply showed up and we started to figure out little by little what the tasks were. There was no, no we weren't given any manual. There were no processes. There were no, we got a letter that told us what our job was, how much we were going to be paid and when to show up. I showed up at the McBride House, which is where the registrar's office first was in the summer of 1971, before we actually were working on the campus. And uh, I uh, shared that little house with the director of the computer center, although we didn't have a computer. And, but we did have the model of Ramapo College uh, on a big table, which took up most of the space in the house. And we also shared the space with all of the maintenance people, including the three people who had worked on the estate for Stephen Birch, who had wonderful stories to tell about the history of the last 50 years before we got there. And uh, it was kind of bittersweet to hear them talk about the, the, how the life on the estate went uh, and then to see it being disrupted in such major ways uh, to accommodate what would be Ramapo College. When I got there, um, I thought we were pretty close to opening, but it didn't look like it. There were no parking lots, no paths. There was, there was a lot of construction. Um, there were a lot of people running around looking like they were trying to get us ready, but we were only two months away and there were a mess like you wouldn't believe. Um, trying to figure out how to buy things, how to, how to move things around. You remember this is before the internet, no computers, you had to make telephone calls on landlines uh, and just to buy normal supplies was a major to do. Um, but somehow we got closer and closer to opening and we made a lot of adjustments. Obviously, we weren't going to be able to have a full schedule of classes. So we only had classes that first year at 8, 10, and 12. 
so that at two o'clock we could turn the whole campus over to the construction workers who were busily working on A, B, and C, and D and E weren't really ready to open for a while yet. The mansion was not just an administrative office, but the bookstore was there, faculty offices were there. There was a nurse's office there. The, um, the college um, telephone operator and her little switchboard were at the foot of the stairs when you walked in. Um, and uh, that lobby was used for stu by students to uh, show off whatever activity they were planning. And the admissions office was there. So it was quite a... And the business office was on the first floor where institutional advancement is now. So it was quite an, an eclectic building, but it was in some ways the center of campus because it was the only self-contained building that was fully open when we, when we arrived. Indeed, I forgot that the bookstore was in the basement. So there was plenty, it was a hubbub of, of activity at the beginning. But there were still some issues. The we couldn't get a certificate of occupancy because when the inspector came through a couple of days before opening, there were no room numbers on the, on the classrooms because the little things that were supposed to come from the construction company weren't there yet. So I stayed one night with a set of blueprints, a magic marker and a lot of white paper. And I made up room numbers for every room on campus and went around with scotch tape and put them on all the rooms so that we could get a certificate of occupancy. We didn't have a computer, so we had no nothing, no copies of anything, no schedules. The night before we opened, I drove down to Rutgers, went to the computer center, woke up a graduate student who took a tape of the information about Ramapo College, including all the courses that the students had registered for. And he ran me the data in a way that I could then give out the schedules to students. And we could also have a copy of those schedules because the longest line on the first day when the college opened was students needing a copy of their schedule because they had lost it. So it was, and the line went all the way out the registrar's office. I was so happy that I had gotten copies of those schedules and the roster so that the faculty members knew who was supposed to show up in their classes. Little by little, as issues cropped up, cropped up, the thing that we discovered was that if we talked to each other, we often came up with a solution. We all figured out how to make it work. Yes, there were wires hanging from the ceilings. No, there were no handrails when going up and down the stairs. There were, there were plenty of things that didn't work, but it was exciting. It felt like every day something was getting done. Students started going to classes. The library, such as it was in A-Wing, um, which shared space with the college cafeteria, um, there was, there was activity and people were figuring it out, even if it wasn't exactly what they had expected. Um, the, um, let's see, let's see what I, um, just see, don't have to look and see what else I remember about that time. Well, only A and B opened in the beginning, of course, and a little bit of C where a, little, a few offices were. There, were, uh, there was no furniture. We, could, we didn't get furniture on time. So we were moving things around up until the night before the college opened. Course descriptions. We didn't, a lot of the faculty members who were teaching were teaching for the first time in a college. And they had, of course, read many college descriptions. But we were hoping that the faculty would write descriptions for their courses that would entice students to choose their classes as students had many opportunities to choose their classes more so than at many other institutions. So we wanted those course descriptions to be interesting to students in, get, so that students could understand what they were going to be uh, reading and what, what expectations there were for the outcomes of those classes. And so we worked with individual faculty members to get them to figure out how to do this. And that sometimes meant for me going to 
people's houses to sit down with them with a pen and a pad and then handing that information over to someone who typed it, who then gave it to a printer who was off site to print it up into our schedules. So there was quite a bit of activity that now we think of as kind of simple stuff. We just open an app up on our computer or we, somebody else figures out how to do it for us. But that wasn't the way it was back then. We did everything and we expected everybody to do whatever was asked of them. For instance, in terms of registration, every faculty member sat behind a little box with their cards at registration, with a card for each seat in each of the classes they were going to teach. And students went up to them and talked to them about what's this class going to be like? What, 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 you know, what are the assignments going to be? Um, you know, what are we going to be using as a text? Um, and each faculty member then talked to the students and decided, yeah, sure, it seems like we could, you know, you would enjoy my class. And they would hand them a card. And then the students would gather the cards together for all the classes that they were admitted to and then turn them into the registrar. And we created a schedule from that. Think about how different that is today. <laughs> of course, it's, it's in some ways, it's a lot less personal. The students, we expected 800, 1200 showed up. Who were they? They were a lot like the faculty and staff. They were students who obviously were willing to take a chance on an institution that had a few paragraphs written about what the college was going to be like. And they had to make a leap of faith that this was something that they were willing to embark on with the rest of us. They had to be students who were adventurous and be risk takers. And they had to put up with a lot, everything was a little harder than it would be at an institution that had been operating for a long time. They had to, they had to create everything from scratch, everything that they were interested in in terms of being a college program, whether it was student activities or how they were gonna invite speakers. Um, everything had to be organized if they wanted a radio station, a newspaper, any club or organization. The students were expected to figure it out, work with the few staff that were around and get things started. There was an expectation that they were going to be full participants with us in getting ready. And then of course, the housing. We, we did expect to have housing on campus. Many of you remember that the, what, what are now the College Park Apartments were sitting in modules on North Field for a whole year while we litigated with the company that had built them as to how to get them put together. And finally, we wound up getting that done. And, uh, the, and we opened the second year, we opened College Park Apartments the second year. But in the meantime, we were house students in two motels on Route 17. Now, at Route 17 back then, there were still traffic lights, there was grass on the medians, and we, we thought it relatively okay for students to run across Route 17 from one motel to the other to go back and forth and visit. It was quite an experience. We, many of the students didn't have cars. They hitchhiked from the motels to the campus. Uh, when we were finally able to have campus housing. And as you know, over time, we increased, and certainly with Bob Scott's uh, uh, support, we increased the uh, number of beds we had so students could live on campus. We could create a much fuller residential experience for our students. And I think we've been extraordinarily successful in terms of becoming a residential college. Of course, the current pandemic has upset all of that. And, and this year, of course, there are only a few hundred students living on campus. And that's certainly, certainly a problem for, for higher education in general. Um, I just want to say um, a couple of things about why it is that we're sitting here 50 years later talking about our connections to Ramapo. And I think that uh, one of the things you know, we're old enough now to know what an honor it was to be in that first group of people who came to start what has become Ramapo College. Um, we're astounded that, that, that we had the success we had. We didn't know we had it in us in the beginning. We weren't sure that we were ever going to know and have, figure out how to fully embrace what the original mission of the college was. And we're also happy that some people came behind us and fix the things we didn't get right. 
Um, we enjoy hearing from students about the effect we've had on their lives. And I know that from my own Facebook page and the interactions I've had with Facebook over all these years since Facebook has been around, that uh, the impact that we had has been extraordinary in many cases and certainly very meaningful in the lives of many, many of our graduates. And I, one other thing is that we're also very, very grateful that social media did not exist way back then, because there are things that ha <coughs> happened way back then that are better kept only in our minds and not on a screen like this. Um, individually, I'm sure some people would, uh, you know, like to remember parties at, at Rod Thorpe's house and, uh, oh, parties at a lot of places. Um, and uh, we, we really did bond as a group over time. Many of the people who are on this call right now are still close friends. We still enjoy getting together. And we always talk about how grateful we are for our experience at Ramapo. I just want to end by reading from an article that appeared in, um, I think it was a Mawa um, newspaper uh, from somebody who had attended a graduate from Ramapo College, but who was who was came to the college in the first few weeks and reported what he what he found. Um, and I just want to read what he said. Um, first of all, he talked about he talked about being in the mansion and looking around and uh, except for little things, which are after all a function of size and tradition. There was no appreciable difference in the climate of new little Ramapo and big old Syracuse, where he went to school. Ads for concerts and theater on the wall of a corridor on the second floor of Wing B, still called Wing B, by the way, notices of various students' activities in the hall near the campus store, a student information table set up in the foyer of the mansion, the center of everything. Friday's visit by Charles Evers, mayor of Fayetteville, Mississippi, who just died a few months ago at age 97. Plans for the spring lecture series on the news media. How, how, how prescient that is in terms of what might be a lecture series right now. There's excitement inherent in the process of becoming, in discovering that there are indeed new worlds to conquer, in reaching out for that which is just beyond, in that instant of comprehension. That is the common denominator in all of education. I'm so grateful that I got the best education ever at Ramapo College. Thanks a lot. And I look forward to our discussion. Great. Thank you, Nancy. That was really terrific. We appreciate uh, your sharing with us. Now we're going to move right along to Professor Peterson. Most of you, I think, here know, and I won't belabor any further introductions. Dr. Peterson, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try and call you Charlie today, although for 40 years I've called you <laughs> Chuck. I know, I know. I'm going to try. Uh, but I want to thank you, Charlie. Uh, I did it once at least. I want to thank you for all the work you do to make these programs possible. I think I once described you in a meeting years ago as uh, the glue that held our program together in a lot of ways. And you're continuing, continuing to do that. So I thank you. Thank you very much, Cliff. Thank and you. And I want to thank Nancy for a wonderful insight into just how difficult it was to get this college off the ground. I have the feeling it was launched with on a wing and a prayer. Uh, and so thank you for all you've done, Nancy, as well. Uh, it's a thrill for me to just see everyone's faces. It's almost like a faculty meeting. Well, maybe I don't want to think Not for it. bed, Cliff. As I think that's a bad memory, not a good memory, but anyway. Um, and by the way, my name is not Carol Ryan. <clears throat> I haven't changed it. Uh, that I'm doing this from my new wife's laptop. Uh, and I'll have more to say about her before I end. Um, she has a very special Ramapo connection as well. Um, I do want to take note of the many of our colleagues over the years that have passed away, some at much too early an age. Um, 
And uh, I think the last colleague uh, who did pass away that I'm aware of is Hal Lieberman. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we, in talking about the early days at the college, we have many memories of people who are not with us any longer. I also, um, before I start talking about my recollections and thoughts about Ramapo, I do want to um, mention a uh, more distressing item, and that is you may or may not have been aware of the fact that 16 Ramapo staff members were recently fired um, as part of the financial stresses the, uh, the institution is under. Um, they were peremptorily uh, fired a phone call and then asked to clear out their offices and escorted off campus unceremoniously. This is not the Ramapo that I remember in terms of how we treated one another. And uh, this was done without acknowledgement of, in some cases, 30 and 40 years of service to Ramapo College. And this included Pat Chang, Dorothy Eccles, uh, Kathy Finnegan, and a number of other people. Mm. Uh, so I wanted to acknowledge that and perhaps inform some of you that may not have been aware of it. <clears throat> uh, how did I get to Ramapo College? Uh, and um, it's an interesting story. I had a simple outline. Every time I went over it, I added items. I, it's so small, I can't read it very well. So I'll try and tick off some of these points. Maybe we can elaborate on them later on in the discussion. Um, my first teaching job was at St. Lawrence University in upstate New York, uh, very close to the Canadian border. I had been born and brought up in New Jersey, uh, and my wife uh, was interested in going to either law school or medical school, which was not possible uh, that far removed from civilization, quote unquote. We were anxious to get back to a metropolitan area. I was looking at uh, ads for college positions. Uh, I came across, I think in the New York Times, an ad for a new college in northern New Jersey. Um, and like Nancy, I didn't know very much about Mawa. That was really way out in the boondocks. Uh, and the, the college sounded really interesting, intriguing. Uh, the, the four pillars uh, were mentioned, the college notion of interdisciplinarity and international and multicultural and experiential, things that were exciting to me and things that uh, people of my generation coming out of graduate school or first job uh, were really inspired by. And I will say that even uh, before I retired, interviewing uh, candidates for position, faculty positions at Ramapo, they are still inspired by those words and, and those ideals and values that we really tried to build on in those early years. Uh, so I applied to Ramapo based on this ad, uh, scheduled an interview on spring vacation break, spring of 1972. Uh, we came down here, I had an interview in Charlie Carrera's office, uh, the office he occupied for many decades. And uh, it was Charlie, Paul Elevitz, and two students whose names I amazingly remember, Bill Hess and Pete Caruso. There were two faculty and two students. There was equal power shared between faculty and students uh, and the notion of shared governance and so forth a pretty radical idea at the time. Uh, and uh, I was offered the position amazingly. And uh, then we had to figure out if we could 
find a house or someplace to live in the area uh, and whether we could afford it. And it looked for a few days like that was gonna be impossible. We kept going further and further from Mawa and we finally, as we were about to give up and go back to Canton, New York, um, we saw an ad for a handyman special in a town in Bergen County we'd never heard of. And we could afford it just barely taking a chance. And so that's how I wound up at Ramapo. And then coming in that following fall for my first semester, and I think this was Eddie's first semester as well, uh, Nancy covered the context of the times, the turbulent 60s, uh, the uh, notion of Ramapo being an alternative to the existing state colleges, a different kind of institution along with Stockton in the South and innovative and experimental. Um, and so out of the ferment and debates over higher education in the 60s and the critique of survey courses and that sort of thing, uh, Ramapo was born in that kind of environment. Uh, it was also, as Nancy pointed out, a commuter school. Uh, it was basically an institution where 90 plus percent, Nancy can correct me on this, of the students those first few years were commuters. Uh, and uh, it didn't have the feel of a college. You would go on campus and there were not, it didn't have the feel of a residential institution. Um, and students would jump in their cars and go home or go to their job so they could raise enough money, earn enough money to pay for their cars and maybe their tuition. Uh, and was it a real college? It didn't have that feel because it was essentially a commuter school. Uh, and I can remember my excitement many years later when I came on campus on a weekend and there were actually students around and they were on skateboards and having you know, playing Frisbee and things that you would normally associate with a college. That was a revolutionary change in the nature of the institution. What kind of a place did I start to teach at? It was a place that um, had a very impressive young faculty. Uh, in fact, in a book, a study by David Reisman of new colleges that were started along with Ramapo, a book called The Perpetual Dream. Uh, he talks about the Ramapo faculty. Um, he compares it to the Oberlin faculty and makes the comment, it was an Oberlin faculty looking for an Oberlin student body. Uh, and I don't know whether we ever found that, but we had a lot of students who were there like we were for the right ideas. They were excited by a new venture creating something from scratch. Uh, and there were some interesting ideas, radical ideas to some extent, innovative ideas, certainly. The interdisciplinary concept, uh, the notion of uh, tutorials, which perhaps was influenced by George Potter's Oxford experience to an extent. The um, required se two senior uh, interdisciplinary seminars, very few requirements, very few required courses. Uh, and I can remember sitting down that first September with my new students in the tutorial, um, about 14 of them, and I was giving them a pep talk, kind of excited at the fact they could create their own programs. They could pick courses. They could almost design their own majors. Other students couldn't do this at other institutions. And I go through my five or 10 minute spiel and invariably each one of them would look at me and say, okay, can you tell me what to take? <laughs> so, uh, you know, we had work to do. Um, it was an incredibly intense, exciting, turbulent, first few years, 
created every new course we taught was a new course uh, designed from scratch in many cases. Um, building curriculum, uh, designing requirements, new majors, interdisciplinary majors, figuring out what interdisciplinarity is, uh, shared governance, the expectation you would spend a lot of your time on committees and working with faculty and students and sharing decisions. Uh, in our unit council meetings, each school that was the decision making group for each school, initially students had 50% of the votes. Uh, this is quite incredible. Uh, unfortunately, they got bored with all these meetings, not that we ever did, and uh, they started dropping out, you know, uh, and I kept saying to them, one of my great campaigns was to say, you have so much power here. All you have to do is reach down. As Mao said, it's lying on the floor. Just reach down and pick it up. Uh, and it sort of went through their hands in a way. Um, and let me just share um, some other kinds of thoughts about the college in those early days. Um, what was our public image? Um, I think Nancy was alluding to this a bit. Um, first of all, it's a community college, isn't it? Where is it again? Uh, oh, where the hippies and the radicals are. And all those crazies that are up there on campus, you know, uh, the Berrigan brothers and Liz McAllister and the anti-Vietnam protesters and Jane Fonda's coming up to uh, talk to the students and uh, it was a heady time. We had incredible speakers like Anthony Burgess who came in and spent time with uh, all of us faculty and students. We had something uh, known as the Saturday College, which was great for returning students, women who perhaps uh, were ready to go back or start college and people that worked uh, nine to five jobs during the week. Incredible students in those Saturday college programs. Um, let me just kind of go through some quick images because I know time is a concern here. Uh, sort of things that stay in your mind about Ramapo. Um, the outdoor pool <laughs> on the slope below the sloping lawn and back of the garden which was one of my favorite spots on the whole campus, by the way, that garden oasis. But the pool, um, which was part of the original estate, of course, and for young faculty with families who'd spread out on that sloping lawn with blankets and uh, have picnics, it was like a country club. It was like a private country club for, for the faculty. It was fantastic. People today walk by it. It's filled in with grass. They have no conception of what that was like back in those early 70s. Um, the copper beech tree, which the kids used to call the elephant tree, which Bob Scott, by the way, did a great deal to sort of um, uh, publicize. And we talked about it maybe was an inspiration for Joyce Kilmer's poem. It was a magnificent tree that unfortunately had to be cut down a few years ago. Um, but uh, it was called the elephant tree because that's where the kids in the daycare center, including my two kids, um, would go and play. Uh, and having a daycare center with faculty with a lot of young children was incredible. The fact we lost that is one of my really sad regrets about the college. Um, the arch, and I see Marshall Hearth is here. Mm -hmm. The arch is such a focal point, but then Marshall's brilliant idea about uh, having graduation and the students proceed through the arch. Uh, the graduations, such fond memories for me. Um, the building on Route 17 where the original office of the college was. Uh, and it's still there. And every time I pass it, I think there were people sitting there. They didn't exactly know what the college was going to be, but they had ideas. They had a vision 
and that vision has become an incredible reality after 50 years. And it's thrilling to uh, reflect on that. Uh, like Nancy, um, uh, I feel privileged to have been uh, part of this adventure, this quest for the perpetual dream of education. George Potter once referred to education as a magical process. It does involve magic when it works the way it should. And we can be thankful for the students that we've had and to see what they've gone on to do in their lives. Uh, it's been a privilege. Uh, we all share that kind of gratitude. Ramapo really is a special place. The connection that alumni have is different than a lot of other, maybe most other institutions. Uh, and we feel that same kind of bond. Uh, Ramapo is more important to me at this stage of my life than ever before, in part because I met my new wife, Carol Ryan, uh, at, in connection with the 50th anniversary celebrations. And we had been on campus in the early 70s. She was in the first class of students at Ramapo without the classrooms, without doors and ceilings and Nancy's little so hand-drawn signs of the numbers of the classrooms. Um, we must have passed in the hall hundreds of times over those four years, three years that we were both on campus at the same time. Never met. And then last year in connection with the 50th anniversary, we met. Uh, we got married on May 30th. And both of us feel that Ramapo is just an absolutely central part of our lives. So um, we both owe a great debt of gratitude to the college. And I, I owe a great debt of gratitude to all of you out there uh, who are on these screens, uh, just wonderful colleagues, lifetime friends, and we all share that special bond. So thank you all. And I'll turn it over to Eddie, who will pick it up from there. Just, just one minute, Eddie, before you start in. Um, at the end of this, uh, Eddie's presentation, Cliff and Nancy and Eddie can react to what each of them have said very briefly. And then there are 46 of you here on this uh, program, very impressive group. And uh, as I look around, I recognize most everybody. You all have a connection, most of you with Ramapo. And there's an opportunity to ask questions, please, in the chat room and uh, I will monitor those and uh, we'll go from there. So Eddie, you're on. Well, my big mistake was uh, letting Nancy and Cliff speak before me because they covered so much <laughs> of the stuff that I had uh, in my mind, but that's okay. That's what friends do. You, you lost the coin flip at the 50 yard line, Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, in any event, um, when I, um, was interviewed. Well, first of all, I lived in a two-family house in, in Newark. And um, when I came up for my interview, the uh, person, we lived down uh, downstairs, the guy who lived upstairs, uh, um, he interviewed at the same time, not for my job, uh, but he interviewed uh, uh, another part of the college. At any rate, Robbie had given me some instructions of, uh, about the interview, which basically boiled down to, you know, when you go and eat, don't eat anything that's going to end up, you know, getting on your clothes or whatnot. <laughs> so we're in the cafeteria. I remember this like it happened, uh, you know, lunchtime yesterday. And um, I ordered a tuna fish sandwich. The other guy, Peter McNamara, ordered franks and beans. He sat down, show you my hands. He had the knife, he had the fork, he cut the franks and beans all over the table. Bottom line, I got hired. I never saw him again in my life. <laughs> so, you know, that was, that was the beginning. 
um, the the uh, the day of the interview, and I remember uh, Rudy Von Berg uh, was uh, a part of the interviewing team, and Beverly Dunn, and and a couple of students. Um, I met George Potter, and um, I got home, and Robbie said, "You got this telephone call from George Potter," and uh, he hired me right there, same day. Uh, wow ran into the uh, same issue that Cliff had, uh, needed a place to live in, uh, in and around Mawa when, you know, when you're a, a science person, it's best if you live close to where the lab would be. Uh, we didn't have the lab at the time, but we knew that it was coming. And, uh, and again, um, we, uh, work with a real estate agent and a uh, real estate agent of the uh, house that we were interested in, the last inexpensive house in Mawa uh, was Linda Dater. And um, she, you know, we, we worked out a plan and uh, then I needed a mortgage. And so I, uh, I went to George Potter and uh, he said, I'll let you know what's going to happen here in a day or two. And he uh, finally gave us the name of the president of the Suffern Savings Bank. And uh, he said, go and see this guy. And Robbie and I went and lo and behold, it was a mortgage that we could afford. And so we, uh, we moved to, uh, to Mawa and uh, lived on, are you ready for this? The Vine Drive. 14 Divine Drive. And um, the rest is, is, is kind of history because as many of you know, I'm still working at Ramapo. And um, when I came here, I, I did find a familiar face or two, uh, ultimately. Um, I found uh, Dick Graham, who had been a colleague of mine in graduate school. I found Marshall Hart, who was a lab partner with me at Rutgers where we took some courses together. So, um, you know, there, it, it, it was kind of like going to an uh, unfamiliar place, but with some very familiar, uh, familiar people. In any event, um, it was, it was very easy to make friends at, uh, at, at, at Ramapo and, um, among the people who I, I uh, met uh, pretty early was, uh, remember that switchboard down at the bottom of the stairs in the mansion? Well, the switchboard operator was Olga Cernak. Mm -hmm. Olga lived around the block from me, actually, on the Vine mm -hmm. Drive. She lived in Alexandra Court. But there were so many people who, who uh, involvement at the college in those early days made, uh, made the college what it is. And, and I have to say that um, a, a number of those, uh, of, of, of those uh, folks are, are on this call. And of course, a number of them have, uh, you know, have passed away. But of course, there was George and, and later on, uh, Lori Potter, and Art Jacobs, and Ray Panati and Dick Roberts. And I have a, a, an Art Jacobs story. Um, as we were building the G building, and it's still the G building, um, the budget came in um, somewhat higher than, than was expected. That's probably uh, not to be unexpected. At any rate, um, prior to that, I had spent summers um, at the Marine Bio Biology Laboratory up in Woods Hole and one of the things that I noticed about that place was they did not have any locks on the doors. People just trusted each other. If they needed a piece of equipment, they went and they borrowed it and left the note. The front door was always open. And so uh, I was on the planning committee for, uh, for G and uh, they went to Art and I said, listen, I, I, I think I can save us couple of hundred thousand dollars 
Uh, and he said, how? I said, well, no locks. I, I, I know Art lived a long, long time, but I know I shaved a year off of his life, at least <laughs> that remark. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dick Roberts, and I see uh, Dick is on, on, on the call, but, you know, people like uh, Herman Kaufman and Cipher CD and Ed Cody, Howard Radis, Jim McCarthy, uh, Henry and, uh, and Pam, and of course, uh, Nancy and Tim, Joe May, Bob Cassidy, Florence Thomases. Um, you know, these were people who were a lot smarter than I was, uh, but without them, the, the college, I think, would uh, not have grown the, the way that it, it did grow. And, um, but I do have some interesting, uh, you know, memories. For instance, um, when I said we didn't have labs, well, we did, but they were in the Nike base, uh, which was uh, uh, down the block from the campus and is right now a, uh, a Rio Vista housing development where uh, I don't think anybody uh, who was associated with the college at the time nor uh, nor is on this call, could afford to live in those places, but uh, uh, that's what happened. We, uh, we had the, the uh, it was actually a, a retrofitted barracks. We did have some uh, equipment. We had some microscopes and so on, and uh, we were able to uh, teach our classes. Uh, for those of us who were in the lab, that was actually the, uh, the first, uh, you know, faculty club. There was a little corner where we kept some, some wine and uh, had a little refrigerator with some cheese and crackers and so on. Um, then, of course, uh, came the, uh, the, con the construction of the G building and the, uh, the story that I just told. And uh, not too long ago, actually, the G building was completely rehabbed and uh, it actually went, uh, went, took everything that was uh, in the in the G building, took it out, went down to the walls. We did it in phases. Um, first two floors, and uh, well, they started at the top and then worked down. So we lived in the first two floors. Um, but the bottom line is, we were we were just a big family, and um, everybody uh, knew each other. Our uh, our wives, our husbands, our kids, we, we kind of grew up together and um, we worked together, we watched out for each other. Um, one, of the, one of the early things I remember was being part of the Senate. The Senate was the, uh, the governing body of the, of, of the college. It included uh, uh, one third administrators, one third faculty and one third students. And the rules of the game were that there had to be a, uh, at least one representative of each of those groups in order for a, uh, uh, a vote to take place. So as uh, Nancy mentioned, uh, we had A's, B's and C's. We didn't have uh, D's and F's. So, uh, it's not that people didn't fail out, they know credited out. That is, uh, you had to accumulate a certain number of credits over a certain period of time. And I see that there are a couple of students uh, on, on, on older students. I see Bill Boyajian, I, uh, uh, Gene Ottens. I never would have recognized uh, Gene Ottens on, on the street uh, now. In any event, so uh, of course the students were not interested in uh, those D's and F's. And so um, under the leadership of a, of a, a fellow, I believe his name was Mark McIntosh. At any rate, they simply boycotted the meetings. They boycotted the meeting. They didn't go to the meetings. We couldn't have a vote. Um, George kind of took a, uh, uh, he wasn't exactly thrilled with that. And so he uh, disbanded the Senate and created a faculty uh, a governance structure and a student's governance structure. And over the years, I was uh, 
president of the faculty assembly uh, a couple of times. And, you know, those, those first, uh, that first group of students, uh, there are some who think that, you know, they were kind of uh, like many of the faculty members, sort of uh, uh, nonconformists, uh, hippies. Uh, but among that group, and what I did is uh, I, I, I went to my grade book from those early years. And um, I, I went down the list of students that I had in my classes and, um, and, and, and some of the successes for those students. Um, I don't know whether any of these folks are, well, some of them are, are on the call, some of them aren't, but uh, you know, Joe Collins, uh, one of the early graduates, uh, principals ultimately became principals of Indian Hills High School. Uh, Greg Ryan became an uh, entrepreneur, and uh, uh, God forbid you should need a, uh, uh, a visit by the local fire department, but each fireman uh, carries a, 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 a tool. It looks like a, uh, uh, well, it kind of looks something like that, and there's a, a, a hammer on one end and a ball peen hammer on the other and a fork kind of thing on the other, and he invented that. Um, Joanne Florio uh, became a chiropractor. Uh, uh, Ken Eisenberg became a physician. Andre LeJoy, a physician. Mark Schreuer, veterinarian. Anthony DiCarlo, veterinarian. Uh, Kathy Berkowitz, uh, a, a, a nurse. Dave Clays, uh, a, a teacher. And uh, I know Dave, um, uh, he's a neighbor. And one of his students, Mike Flood, is a recent, more recent graduate of Ramapo, and Mike works uh, for the EPA. Um, Dave Van Sluten is a, is, is a physician. Uh, Janet Pepperdine uh, went into uh, industry. Paul Licata uh, became a physician. Anthony Anarello became uh, an attorney. So, um, Many of our students, if uh, the large percentage of them were real serious uh, students. And, uh, you know, I see Bill here. I know he's had some success in, uh, in the computer industry. He was one of the earliest uh, uh, of our computer science majors. And one of the things about um, my colleague, Vic Miller, who is still here working at the college, he keeps record of every single student that he has ever had keeps in touch with them and knows where what they're doing right now and Vic is uh, probably uh, close to 48 49 year uh, uh, colleague at the college so those are some of my thoughts and um, the only thing I, I, I have two other things to, uh, uh, to tell you about is you know on a lot of the uh, the, the media uh, publicizing this event. There's a picture of me in my earlier years when I had a little bit more hair on top of my head. And um, I had a little book in my pocket. It was the calendar where I had to be, when I had to be, here it is. So I still have that calendar. Um, and a word or two about uh, Herman Kaufman who was the founding uh, director of uh, of TAS, Herman was uh, pretty well uh, connected in the uh, in the science world. Um, he was kind of an old guard kind of guy, and I guess right now I'm sort of the old guy kind of guy on campus. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, when ultimately the uh, uh, the uh, the G building was uh, uh, was dedicated, um, he was able. Uh, to get a fellow by the name of Watson to uh, say a number of words. You may have heard this guy Watson connected with another guy by the name of Crick. So uh, he was able to get uh, James Watson to, uh, uh, to come onto campus. Now I remember that uh, earlier in the day, a number of faculty, uh, including uh, uh, the late Bob Shine and the late Grace Borowitz, we, we went to some Japanese restaurant in, in, in 
uh, in Suffern, and we were sitting in the this tatami room uh, where you're essentially sitting on the on the floor, and there's a table inside. And Grace was a well-known uh, uh, photographer, not nearly as talented as uh, as Vince or Marchese, who was on the call. At any rate, she took out her camera and aimed it at James Watson and took this flash picture. And he, I, I don't know what he, whether he thought some, that it was a gun and she was shooting him, but he jumped up and just left, you know, just left the room. Um, it was also the, uh, one of the earliest times that I think Bob Shine, uh, who was not, uh, yes, Maiko from uh, Cindy Brenner, Brennan uh, uh, chatted me in. At any rate, um, Bob Shine, uh, a, 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 a real gentle soul, uh, was 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 there at that restaurant, and um, somehow or other, he ate something that was uh, that really excited his taste buds. Some chili, uh, something or other, and he too, along the way. Uh, really, uh, I mean, I, his face turned bright red, as red as Vince Marchese's uh, uh, Ramapo sweatshirt. At any rate, uh, I have a memory of that. And then um, I have a memory of, uh, of George Wald coming onto campus. Now, George Wald was another Nobel Prize winner who uh, uh, did uh, the early research on color vision. And um, he came to uh, dedicate uh, uh, G building. And um, I remember that I picked him up at the train station in, uh, in Newark. Uh, he was on the faculty at Harvard and uh, he made a, a, a brilliant speech. And those are some of the early memories I have of, uh, of the college. And so I'll turn it back to, uh, this guy, uh, what's his name, Charlie. But one, one other thing, uh, one of the earliest and uh, until very recently uh, uh, faculty social groups was the Friday afternoon tennis group. And uh, a number of us, including, uh, including Chuck and along the way, uh, many, many people uh, played along with us. Uh, Judy Peck, Rudy Van Berg, Bernie Langer, uh, Bill Dunn. Um, so I, I, I have very fond memory. And, and, and Eddie, Roger, Roger is hiding on this. He's not uh, visible, but he's hiding on this Zoom call. So you can mention him too. I don't know why, I didn't know Roger was so shy. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie, that was great. Uh, uh, before we continue, uh, I think it's appropriate now, given that it's 1215 and some people are leaving for football games soon. There's some interesting questions. Before we get to those, I wanna invite Peter Rice, who's asked me to give him a couple of minutes to tell you about the new Alumni Association. Uh, so Peter, I don't know, uh, can you, are you unmuted, Peter? I am, Charlie, thank you. Okay, good, good. Uh, I'd like to say that we, we want to cooperate with the college on this 50th anniversary. We continue. Founders Day is coming up uh, next week, I guess, Peter. Yeah, uh, Founders Day, yep, November 18th. And um, we're going to be naming the Learning Commons uh, at 1230. It's going to be done on a live stream. But we're also going to be burying a time capsule um, with 50 years worth of stuff in it that's going to be open 50 years from now on the 100th anniversary of the college. Dr. Mm -hmm. Mercer is actually going to mention the Mawa group, which I'm very excited about, and the e exhibit at the museum. And we're also, I arranged with Charlie to be able to get a flyer about the exhibit that is also going to be placed in the, the 50 year time capsule. So some exciting things coming up. Cliff did mention, you know, the dark times that we've had recently at the college. And as a manager there, it was and some people I hope don't disagree with this, but it was for me the darkest day in Ramapo's history, the day that he mentioned. So things have not, some things have been really good, but some things have been very, very hard, but um, we're a little down in staff in the alumni area, but 
Many of you do know me from my 14 years in the admissions office. I had the honor of sitting at Rita's desk in the McBride house for 14 years. I cried the day that I left it, but I am now up in the alumni office. And I just, Charlie was gracious enough to give me this minute to just let you all know that I am there now in the alumni office. My email is easy to remember. It's the word price at ramapo.edu, or you can also reach me at the word alumni at ramapo.edu. And I do want to hear from all of you. I do want to hear what you want to do as an alumni association going forward. You know, money is a little tight now, and obviously we can't get together as much as we would like on the campus. But if you could share with me the things that you want to talk about and the things that you might want to do in the future, I would be absolutely honored to try to work together with folks on this group to get some of these things taken care of. Um, and one last thing I, I see in the chat, Bill Boygian has been super helpful to me um, to get started. He put together um, our 5K virtual race that has been going on. We've raised about $1,500 for the annual fund. We split it up to students versus alumni, alumni winning at this point in time. So I want to give a special shout out to Bill, a Ramapo Hall of Famer that really helped me get started with that. And I want to thank Charlie and all of you for allowing me these few minutes to talk to you. I hope to hear from you all very soon. Peter, Thanks. I'll touch Peter. I'll touch base with you. You know, I was one of the first alumni presidents. Um, so, and I have a lot of resources, a lot of historical information on the alumni association. And of, course, and of course, the images that I have over those years. So we'll talk and I'll touch base. We'll see I'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much. I guess everybody can see the chats. Uh, one thing that I've noticed there that Gordon put up that's quite interesting about the turnover in the faculty. and. And during the 70s, most faculty that were hired in the 70s stayed around, although we remember some of our faculty friends disappeared and went to other places. But uh, he compared that with Stockton that had a, had a huge turnover. Gordon, do you want to comment briefly on uh, that? You're muted, Gordon. I'm muted. Okay, if I'm, no. I'm, I'm muted, hello, every. Buddy, look, there's Teddy Helper, and at least on my screen right now, hello, Dr. Helper, and you and I came to Ramapo College the same day, the, the fall of 1974. I met you at an orientation session led by then Vice President of Academic Affairs, Bob Cassidy. After a few years, we people lucky to be at Ramapo became aware that David Reisman, the noted sociologist at Harvard University had written a book about experimenting, experimental new colleges in America. And a factoid uh, circulated widely on campus from that book, which was that according to Reisman's research, 100% of the founding faculty at our sister school, Stockton, had left within five years, driven away apparently by conflict with the president. And as we all know, weren't we fortunate, folks, we all got along well with one another. We got along well with President Potter. Relations between the administration and the union were, I don't know if I should say cordial, but they, they, they were able to work together well enough and remember the strikes, the difficulties um, arising from labor management issues um, on other college campuses there. And so turnover was low at Ramapo College and it remains among the faculty, of course, notoriously high in the senior ranks of the administration. So I was counted myself fortunate to have discovered such warm collegial competent colleagues and by the way, um, I enjoyed going to faculty meetings in part to hear people think on their feet, in part to enjoy their effectiveness as, as orators. And um, some of the notable people who spoke effectively, especially effectively from those days included Dick Bond. Yes, you folks remember Dick Bond. But again, the question is fundamentally about low turnover. Now I'm muting myself. 
Thank you. And Hugh Carolla had an interesting uh, insight. Hugh, you want to share your remembrance? Oh, thanks. Um, thank you for uh, being able to be here too, guys. It's really cool. I know some of you were on the boat with me uh, a couple of years ago with uh, myself and Captain Bill Sheehan at Hackensack Riverkeeper. Yep. The, that was a very nice evening, Hugh. Thank you for that. We can hopefully do it again sometimes so when things get better, you know. But um, so I was at school uh, from 76 to 80. And uh, at freshman orientation, I, I'm still, I can still recall, I don't remember his name, is the African-American gentleman. And he spoke about the fact that, now you're gonna see a lot of people in wheelchairs here. You're gonna see a lot of people who are handicapped people with disabilities. Um, and I would hope that you might say hello, and perhaps offer to help, assist, hold the door open or whatever. But don't be surprised if they say no thank you. Because you see, this school was built from the bottom up, was designed to be barrier free, to make it easier for not only those folks, but for everybody to be here at this campus, to go to school, to learn and be part of this community. That has stayed with me ever since. And I tell people um, uh, that I learned so much um, from many of you, but also the experience of being at the school. Uh, I tell people it's the first place I, I met gay people who were out. Uh, it's the first time I met people from other countries. First time I had meaningful conversations with people of, of another race. Um, it, it really, in so many ways, made me, or at least <laughs> really gave me such a foundation that I was able to fortunately build upon uh, in my personal and professional career uh, to, to, you know, really make me not the person I could have been had I gone the way of so many people in my generation, of my ethnic background, of my, you know, blue collar, white, you know, suburban track that, you know, I could have gone and thank God that never, I derailed that fairly quickly, thanks to Ramapo. People like you, Charlie and Cliff and, 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 and Dick Bond. Um, real quick, one last thing, I'm sorry. Um, the day after Jimmy Carter won the election, Dick Bond walks into class, pulls out a cigarette, which you know in those days we could do. <laughs> well, guess y'all gonna have to learn how to talk Southern now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, smoking in class, beer in the cafeteria, oh my God. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Okay, I see another comment here from uh, Michael Longchamp, uh, which you can elaborate in just a minute. And I'm reminded, uh, we are still collecting memories and artifacts at the museum. We archive those and maybe if the exhibit continues to be popular and if we ever open again on a regular basis and you know, all of you can come in, y'all can come in. Uh, then maybe we'll carry the exhibit over. We're due to end it in June. So Michael, do you wanna talk anything about uh, your comment? Oh, I, graduated, I think I graduated in what, 76? I don't even remember, it's long ago. Anyway, I, this gave me the opportunity to go through a lot of the negatives I had, and I just wanted to know where I could send them if they wanted to- uh, To the museum. To the museum? Yes, okay. go to the website and you'll, you'll see the contact information there. That's really terrific. And uh, to echo Hugh's comments, uh, having grown up in Ramsey, New Jersey, uh, Ramapo College was a big eye-opening. And I have many fond memories of many of the individuals there that I would never have met had I gone to an, probably another college. I mean, I have memories of Rick Thomas rolling around in his, in his, in his uh, wheelchair. And that was probably the first exposure I ever had to a person who was disabled. And the discovery that Rick Thomas was physically disabled, but he certainly wasn't mentally disabled. And that, you know, hey, in a wheelchair. And it was my first real opportunity to find African-Americans, which Ramsey, New Jersey had none, okay? And open up that whole avenue to, uh, to, to a, an 18 year old. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. You're welcome. I, I see one of my younger colleagues on here now, Paula Strady. She's, she's taking all of this history in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I see um, Louis um, Severini is talking about his lab partner. Louis, you want to share that story? Well, I was a, a student, 75, 76, and uh, I don't know how good a student I was. I was one of Dr. Safe's students, but uh, chemistry was not one of my strong suits at the point. <laughs> so the first couple of weeks there, I had a couple of fairly close calls in the in the lab hood. And I found I was assigned someone to uh, watch over me and, and actually got through the class pretty well without, like I said, doing much damage to the G building at all. So it was a it was a fun experience there. Okay, uh, anybody else uh, want to comment? Yes. If you give me a wave, uh, tail. By the way, what if, very fast. This is, uh, it was 1974, 46 years ago. You will remember me very easily because of my accent. And then 46 years <laughs> later, I still have the same accent. <laughs> uh, something stays. But one of the things that has been stressed is look at the faces, look how many of us, how many years we spent in that place. That place called Ramapo, where I remember I was working in New York at the Yeshiva University, and I was carpooling with Irving Borowitz. Irving Borowitz, one day I was not happy there, and one day Irving says, you know, there is a, my wife, uh, Grace, and this works in a place where they are looking for a physicist. I said, oh yeah. Yeah, she's working at Ramapo College. I said, what? What a college? Ramapo mm -hmm. College. And what is that? It's in Mawa. What is Mawa? <laughs> <laughs> that was essentially the question. So, uh, Eddie, while you were talking about opening of the G building, uh, I was the first one that had the key of that building. Because when I was hired, it was a few months before the beginning of the, uh, of, of the, the school year. And they said, would you like to make a few more bucks during the summer? I said, yes. So there was a moving of all the labs from the D wing to the new G wing. So they gave me the key and I was allowing people to get in and out. One of the things that shows very clearly the type of personal relations we had is I remember years ago when uh, Phil Anderson used to tell me when we were going where I was visiting, I already retired, but I was visiting Ramapo. And he said, you know, Teddy, to go from the G building to the cafeteria, it takes us about an hour. <laughs> and the reason was the number of people on the way, so, oh, Teddy. <laughs> and it was genuine, it was honest, so it was family. And is that place is a unique place. It has been an extraordinary part of my life. I thank you, so many of you, for having made that possible. And uh, one of the extraordinary things too, very uncommon, is the number of students that still get in touch with me and how well they have done. In a place where so many, many people will say, well, what is the second, third rate? Oh yeah? Measured by what? This is the level of interaction between faculty and students I have visited a number of places. I have never seen anything like this. And so the Ramapo that I know has changed. And what happened these last events with the fighting of people is not our Ramapo. It's a, it continues to have the same name, it's not the same Ramapo. But I, I have a, a tremendous sense of appreciation for all of you and how much you, you meant for my life and for the life of our students. Charlie, thank you for having made this position possible, as a Yogi Berra used to say. Thank so you, me, thank you, Tao. Um, can I follow up a little bit on that? Well, just one second. I want to add a, 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 new, uh, a new element here. I see one of my former adult audit, audited students, uh, Jim Fitzgerald on here. You remember in the 70s, we had a lot of re returning students and uh, retired people auditing our classes and they provided such a wonderful dimension to the class. And 
observations and challenged us in, in ways that we needed to be challenged. And I thank them for that. Was it, Eddie, was that you? Was that you? Yeah, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to follow up a little bit on that, uh, on, 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 on what Teddy had to say. Um, you know, of course, before uh, COVID, um, as I would walk up and down the halls, um, faculty member offices were typically open. Um, students were, were typically in those offices interacting with faculty members. Um, today, we, um, we offer even, even remotely all manner of tutoring. I think one of the things that makes Ramapo different than uh, so many places is that um, the commitment that the faculty had to the students. So I'm gonna give one example back um, back in the early 70s, um, well, maybe the late 70s, a guy by the name of Leo McLaughlin uh, joined us and uh, uh, Leo uh, took over the, uh, the tutorial part of, uh, of who we were. And, um, and Leo and I were, well, we were neighbors. And uh, it became time for our annual physicals. And I really didn't have a doctor at the time. And he said, you know, I got this guy in Oakland who I've known for years and years. And so I went and um, the nurse was one of our students. Her name was at the time, Chris Clacken. And, um, and I know that Bernie Langer, and I know Bernie isn't on the call, but Bernie also went to this uh, physician and um, we started, you know, uh, as you do, uh, interacting with, uh, with the nurse who did the, you know, the initial stuff uh, when you go to the doctor. And it became obvious that um, she, while happy being a nurse, really had what it took to go off to medical school. And so uh, between Bernie and myself and, uh, Getting uh, getting Chris excited about uh, about medical school. She went off to medical school, um, practiced for many many years. Ended up marrying um, a guy by the name of Beck, who happened to be working in the chemistry labs, and uh, she just retired from her practice somewhere in eastern uh, Pennsylvania. But uh, she and her husband Al um, made a big donation when we. Uh, opened up the rehab G building and indeed uh, they they made the donation their name is on the door for all the all of the lab prep room for the biology and chemistry lab prep room in, in G. So another another success story and just another example of who was an institution. We were in the 70s but we are now in the 2020 plus yeah. Good. I, I think we have time for two or three more comments. If uh, you want to give me a wave, I, I don't see anything else in the chat room. Uh, Chuck, can I just uh, say one thing? Yes. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Eddie, you, and Cliff for what you did for students. You, building on what Ed just said, I, remem I remember when you were the faculty advisor to International House when we the opened International House and the time and energy you put in to working with our international students to offering programs there to befriending so many of the students. And as you know, those students who were in International House continued to have a relationship with each other because of the work that you did. And I'd like to thank Cliff for all that he did with Model UN and all of those students and all that time he mm -hmm. gave to developing our Model UN program, our teams and, and all the work that he did. And Ed, the work that you did with students, with taking them to professional to the AAAS meetings, to uh, just the enormous work that you did outside of the classroom with the students. You were all wonderful. Great examples. Great examples. There were exciting times where we could jump in and do exciting things. And it was uh, quite interesting, but it was quite exhausting also. <laughs> Patricia Hunt Perry wanted to say something. Patricia, it's good to see you. It's good to be seen and to see you and everybody. 
Um, I want to um, comment or go a little further on what Gordon and um, Teddy had to say, and that is how wonderful it was, the faculty. Um, when I was teaching at Syracuse University when I came to interview, and um, <clears throat> the people that I knew at Syracuse, including my dissertation committee and, <laughs> and my colleagues uh, when I became on faculty, were absolutely appalled that I would consider a small college that was just starting. You have a career, Patricia, you got to go do other things. And I am so thankful that I didn't listen to them and that I came to Gramaco because it was really <clears throat> just a treasure in my life. And um, it was, I just want to say how much I appreciate everybody who helped to build the place and to, um, to maintain it. And um, it's just a joy to see people as well. I live up in upstate New York now, so I don't get to physical gatherings, even when there isn't COVID. But um, I, it's a real joy. And COVID at least has given us this. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Uh, Carol Duncan wants to say something about the arts. We haven't heard about the arts, Carol. It's good to see you also. Thank you. I think I may be the only one here from. <laughs> I think I think I think Jay is here under a different name. Is that you, Jay? You, you're muted, Jay. Jay. Jay's under your name. Um, yeah. Am I unmuted now? Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Uh, but uh, you're hiding as an alias, Jay. Uh, I'm. I'm uh, <laughs> My alias is uh, Charlie Carrera. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to talk about it off, off screen. Uh, we'll go to Carol and then we can go to you, Jay, if you'd uh, like. Carol. I didn't see you were here, Jay. Great to see everyone. It's really a delight. And I just wanted to say, and Jay can, Jay got, I got there the second year and um, and loved it. And I think the, um, the atmosphere of the college was so wonderful for our students. And we've had, you know, huge numbers of people who've gone, had careers in music and theater. Being so close to New York um, made it not, not such an out of the way little college because the faculty was always very connected to, um, to their professions. And so our students went off and did stuff. And um, they had great teachers like Jay Hooley and David Freund and others. And Carol Duncan. Carol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was, um, I also want to say, I used to wake up in the morning and think, oh, good, I'm going to Ramapo today. And that's something, you know, that I was so glad to get get on campus and, and be there and teach and do the stuff we did. So, so thank you, thank all of you, thank you. Jay, it, it just uh, just a note on that. We have a lot about the arts in the exhibit, Carl and Jay. She should stop by and see it. Uh, uh, Artie Chill did a lot of documentation of uh, what you were doing there, and uh, it's really really interesting. And each unit, as you're talking, I'm remembering each unit had its own culture, and we were always curious and fascinated about what was going on in CA. <laughs> Jay, do you have any observations? Only a few seconds. Is it two things? First of all, let's remember Lori Potter and the Office of Specialized Services that made Ramapo a unique place, truly unique. This is, and I think we owe her a lot. And the other one is, you realize what is happening here. This is in general, in regular, normal colleges, people know the people on their department. Mm -hmm. Here, we knew everybody. Mm -hmm. The corridors. We will walk the corridors and talk to people, talk to people in the administration, talk to people of other sections. This is, a, this is the, the friendship, I say, I say uh, not, not Carol Ryan, but Cliff and so on, and, and, and Nancy and so on. They were all, we were all one. And this is unique. This is truly unique. So, so we were not normal, right, Teddy? Is that what you No, we were not, never. <laughs> so Jay, Jay, you want to jump in? Well, the one thing that uh, that I, I wanted actually to follow quickly, the one thing I was going to say had to do with uh, actually with the Nike base. And um, I know that uh, Eddie brought it up, but uh, we were over there too. 
And I remember it, it was my uh, first studio at, at Ramapo and it was in a building that, uh, that actually moved missiles around. And I was able to use the lift there that moved missiles around to uh, <laughs> create art. And uh, I'm not sure that has to do with uh, plowshares exactly. Yeah, but, uh, north into plowshares, Jay. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty. It was kind of fabulous, really. And uh, the, one other thing that we haven't mentioned is there was the opportunity. Uh, you were talking about Rio Vista. One of the great disappointments of mine, uh, one of the very few uh, about Ramapo was the fact that we had an opportunity to uh, purchase all of Rio Vista from uh, the Archdiocese of Newark. And I remember it was $4 million uh, mm -hmm. that they wanted. They ultimately, when they sold it to um, developers, I think they sold it for like around 21 million or something like that. But we could have had that whole thing. It, it's, it was an extraordinary opportunity. And uh, unfortunately, uh, George did not have, uh, I think the insight that uh, might've been necessary to make that purchase with money we didn't have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good you mentioned that, Jay. <laughs> there, are, there, are, there, are, there are always ways of, uh, of, you know, taking on debt, particularly from the Catholic Church. But, but Jay, you remember it, a few years after that, there was talk about us being becoming a nursing home. You remember that? Closing the college altogether. So what would that have been if we had taken on $4 million of debt? Well. <laughs> Hard to say, but it was quite an opportunity. This group is amazing. You're still on. Great. Any other comments? Uh, Could I Marshall, just... did you wave your hand earlier? You're muted, Marsh. Marshall. No, oh, you're you're mute. Let me see if I can unmute you. No. Unmute. Okay. So yeah, there you go. The the quick the quick joke was that, uh, you know, Teddy had said we were like a family. So I wanted to just share with all of you that all my skills doing family therapy, I learned from interacting with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> and it was trial by fire, but uh, just on, re on reflecting the interconnected that we all had really put the notion of interdisciplinarity in the forefront. And it worked. We, we actually learned how to communicate with each other and we advanced our own capacity to communicate with all the other people we had to. Yep. And the, I always felt that one of the best things at Ramapo was the returning students. Yes. We need to you know, remind ourselves that they added a level of uh, insight, which we now have but we were able to take advantage of that within our classrooms. A real quick story. I was teaching a course on Freud and Judaism. And there's always been a question about how religious was Freud. And there was a student, an elderly gentleman who was living in Vienna at the time of the Anschluss and all of that. And he said, when he was a kid, his father took him to the synagogue on Yom Kippur. And he said, look over there, that's Freud. And, you know, I've never seen it documented, but apparently he went to the synagogue probably to ask for forgiveness for all of the sins he had committed. You know, probably shared Sabina Spielrein with, uh, with anybody else. But anyway, um, Ramapo was an, is a wonderful experience. And teaching the students was the best part. People ask me, do you... Uh, do you miss uh, teaching? And I say, no, because I knew I did a good job. But what I do miss is the interactions in that classroom. That's when we were alive. We knew we were doing something well. And it, it, you got the immediate feedback in the classroom. And in the years that followed, when, when people would get back in touch with you, you know, about three years ago, Vince Marchese and I bumped into each other in Cape May, of all places. And it was just wonderful to hear him say the positive things that he could remember from 45 years before. You know, we, we had an impact. And that is that 
gives meaning to your own life. Yeah, I agree with you, Marshall. I do remember the students. It was really great memories. I do not miss those faculty meetings that Gordon referred to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> you know, the one thing that I do notice, however, is that there are no people of color on this call. Yes. We, uh, we were not as good uh, with that as we were with disability, which, um, you know, we had um, Joe Johnson and a few people, but I remember we, we pushed, uh, and I was on those hiring committees to hire more people of color. I, I, would, like to, I would like to add a, a little something to that. I agree with you, Patricia. And the few that we did have, uh, I, I reached out to them for their memories. Uh, um, uh, Luis Rodriguez Abad was in uh, SSHS. Uh, he's down in Texas now. And uh, uh, Jerry Horn, you remember Jerry Horn in American Studies? He's at the University of Houston. He has a, he has a chair there. And, and I tried to get them to, they, they, they had another dimension and it would be an important dimension to hear today, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, they were not available to us. Uh, but uh, thank you for bringing that up. But one thing to remember in 1971, if you look at faculty in higher education, there weren't many women and we have a lot of women on this call. Right. So at least we did something in some right. direction. Right. Right, exactly. Pat myself on the back. <laughs> uh, it was a, it's been a wonderful experience being at Ramapo. It, I just, the best decision I ever made in my life. Not well, no, there were some others, but one of the best was to join the Ramapo mm -hmm. faculty. Charlie, yes. Did, did, we, did we figure out what the interdisciplinarity is? <laughs> Now, uh, Gordon yeah. is going to do, Gordon and Roger are going to do some research on that and report back at the next meeting. <laughs> Don't say, Don't say Topic that. for the next panel. Mm -mm. That's right. <laughs> I can't hear one, that. One, one of my great, great memories of, uh, of Ramapo is teaching many, many years along with Marshall. He yes. taught for, I don't know, 10, 12 years. And what is incredible about that is that our students had writing uh, requirements. Uh, students had to give each of us the, uh, you know, their their work, and then we graded them. And for all of the years that we taught, you never were more than a plus or minus grade away from each other. Right. Yeah. So can can I add to that? My greatest memory, one of my greatest memories, is team teaching with my beloved friend Cliff Peterson from Mao Tse Chang, Revolution to the Third World. It was a great course, but he came in with this gigantic legal pad and I thought, I'll never be able to say a word in this class. <laughs> anyway, it was great fun. I, I learned is, as much as that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that. One of the great things is what we learned from each other in those classes and in the senior seminars, oh wow, it was terrific. And, that was one of the things the college couldn't afford, but what a great opportunity for the students and the faculty. Well, let's not forget Beverly Dunn, who was a founding faculty member who early on decided she wanted to go to medical school. And so she ended up uh, preparing for her medical college aptitude test by taking a number of our courses. And she was on the first panel that we had that's now available as a USB with a modest donation, if I can be so crude as another commercial. Uh, if, you, if you go on their website, send me an email and, and we'll make a copy and you send us $20 and you've got the USB of this great program. That was a lot of fun too. Any closing comments? Yeah, I mean, Bill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, let me just tell you, know, I got a ton of stories, but I'll, I'll keep it quick. I'll just talk about a little story, uh, the, uh, the G building, the G building. Uh, in my, I graduated 75, class of 75, and um, uh, Dr. Roth uh, was my uh, uh, teach, uh, leader, uh, senior you know, advisor. So for the senior project, we all had to do a senior project. He asked me what 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 I want to do, and I figured well I like you know playing around with computers, and you know people didn't have personal computers back then or anything like that. It was just mainframe. But I said to him, 
I'd like to do something on computers. So Jack's uh, professor Roth said to me, oh, well, follow, I got something for you, follow me. So he took me into the G wing, right? And he took me, I believe like the fourth floor and he took me down this dark hallway and he unlocked this, you know, he had a key, unlocked the door into this small little room. And in the room was a PDPA digital. That's like one of the early, 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 early per, uh, kind of personal uh, mini computers they had. And, he's, and I said, well, what do you want me to do? And, and he had a book, like instruction book that was like this thick. And he goes, you figure it out. And, I, and he said, you figure out what to do with it and present it to me as your project. So I said, I don't know. So I figured out I want to write a little program. So back then, you know, you know, there was no keyboards or anything. You had to do toggle switches. I don't know what, and that's like the forerunner of booting a computer back then. So I, to get the computer run, I had to flip some switches. Well, anyhow, to make a long story short, I wiped out like six professors' programs in within a couple of days. <laughs> and nobody said anything. I kept hiding in that room. But finally, on the last day, of course, everybody does thing in the last minute. I went in there, I said, I got to write a little program you know, so I can show it to, uh, as my, you know, final project. So I went in there, it was like morning. I went in there and I, and there was no windows in the room and I worked and I worked and I worked and I actually wrote a little program that you can, you know, put, uh, print out a little cube and have it rotate. And I did on, they had a, like a teletype typewriter. I won't go into that. I'll write about that another time. And I got it and I actually got it to work. And, um, and you had to scan it and everything. And I presented to it, so I got like an uh, a, a plus, but to make a long story short, that was where I really got me into computers. And my whole career has been working with computers and, you know, learning how to do things. And if, it, you know, it wasn't for that, and, you know, Dr. Uh, Roth giving me the opportunity, you know, who knows where I would have gone to, so. Marshall's gonna have the last comment. Comment. The real interdisciplinarity was it ex exemplified by Jack Roth, the artist and the mathematician. Oh yeah, and he uh, filled, definitely he filled he the wall write... backboards with chalk from top exactly. to bottom, and when he erased them, there was a cloud that rose <laughs> over the whole keyway. <laughs> exactly, he used to, in my classes. I remember he used to write, and he was a tall guy, so he would write from the top edge when writing math programs too. Down to, not only to the bottom edge, he started writing, when he ran out of room, he started writing on the rug. And you can imagine if you're sitting in the back of the class, like trying to see what he's writing when it's written on the rug. And then, you know, he'd, he'd fill up. And back then the rooms are like prefabricated. So the, the chalkboard was like the whole wall. So he'd be writing all over the place, not even needing to erase anything. He'd just keep writing and writing. We're going crazy trying to keep up with him. And, and, and that, that exaggeration, my office was across the hall and cloud of smoke would come out. <laughs> you guys, exactly. thank you guys. He Listen, was, thank you all very much. We have all your contacts. You'll be okay. invited to another one of these in the near future. Take care. Charlie, before we sign off, Charlie? What? Before we sign off, I'm going to yes. drag my new wife, Carol. Right. Hi, Hi Carol. Screen. That's what we have in common. Ramapo. Well, Cliff, also, it's something good coming out of uh, museum work, right, Cliff? Right. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Keep up the good, good work. Goodbye. The, Thank uh, you. Bye, the Bye everyone. Bye, -bye everybody. Bye. All right. Bye. 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 Big hugs to everyone.